Hello, and welcome to the Institute of Tax Law at the Center for Commercial Law Studies, the postgraduate law program at Queen Mary University of London. My name is Bernard Schneider, and I'm a senior lecturer, equivalent to associate professor, for those of you used to North American terminology, um, in international tax law. I'm the academic director of the Institute and director of our LLM program. It's really my pleasure today to welcome Professor Joshua Blank to speak about his recent paper co-authored with Professor Leosowski. Uh, Joshua Blank, who is known to at least some of you in our virtual office today, uh, audience today, is a professor of law and faculty director of strategic initiatives at, at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Before joining UC Irvine, he was professor of tax law, vice dean for technology enhanced education, and faculty director of the graduate tax program at uh, NYU School of Law, so New York University School of Law. His scholarship focuses uh, primarily on tax administration and compliance, on taxpayer privacy, and on the taxation of business uh, entities. And he's published extensively in these areas in academic journals, and he's also a frequent contributor to uh, many prominent media outlets in the States. Um, he's going to talk today, as you know, uh, about uh, a particular aspect of uh, artificial intelligence and taxation, but I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the, the broader context. The rise of uh, AI, of artificial intelligence, has a lot of implications for taxation. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is the impact on revenues. Um, given the dependence of many uh, revenue authorities on individual income taxation, uh, what happens when relatively high paid, uh, well paid employees are replaced by AI programs, by robots? Um, and this has led to consideration of a lot of, um, you know, interesting points about the correct balance between corporate and individual income taxation, about the kinds of incentives for capital investment that are perhaps um, inadvertently uh, accelerating this process of automation, which, of course, in many ways is good, uh, but perhaps, again, from a revenue collection point of view is not so good. Um, there's been talk of an uh, automation tax, which would be based on the ratio of employees to revenues. In other words, that the, the fewer employees, which is to say human employees you have, uh, the higher the tax. Um, there's even been a talk, uh, a very interesting proposal about taxing businesses on the imputed uh, or sort of the hypothetical salary that you would pay to a robot. In other words, to treat the savings um, that a company uh, or business uh, gains from automating um, as a taxable item. Another greatly uh, discussed set of issues involves the implications for revenue administration. So the use of AI by revenue authorities in pursuit of their enforcement and collection efforts, probably actually the single biggest uh, sort of uh, body of uh, tax literature in the last few years has been around this area. Things uh, like data mining, a screening for auditing, tax risk management, um, even questions about uh, taxpayer privacy and so on. Um, so and these are, of course, all very important issues. In their article, however, uh, Professor Blank and Professor Osofsky focus on a very different aspect of AI and taxation, namely the use of AI-enabled digital assistance and various contact channels as part of the interface between a revenue authority and tax. Um, and I don't want to, you know, to uh, speak about the uh, excellent research itself, that's obviously for Professor Blank, but um, I do want to make explicit that this is not an issue, relate, you know, that is limited to the United States. Um, other jurisdictions are moving in the same direction. The Canada Revenue Agency has Charlie the Chatbot, uh, the Australian Tax Office has Alex, uh, HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs here in the UK, uh, is working, has a very limited digital assistant, which is working to expand. Um, and uh, the UK, uh, the, excuse me, the Irish Revenue Commissioners uh, have a already trialed a voice bot, um, which they are now looking to expand and to make regular. Um, and it's uh, very clear that other revenue authorities are talking about doing this either uh, uh, you know, for their interface with taxpayers, or in fact, uh, are designing such virtual assistance for their own staff, uh, which is in fact, uh, how the, the US um, system really started. It actually started as an internal tool. So this is 
an area that is important for many jurisdictions and will only become more important as we go forward. So on that note, um, let me uh, hand the floor uh, over to uh, Professor Blank, uh, and I look forward uh, to hearing his excellent, I'm sure, presentation. Josh, please. So thank you very much, Bernard and Christiana at the Institute uh, and all of you for joining today. Uh, I'm really grateful for the invitation uh, to speak at the Institute. And uh, just this is a surprising benefit of uh, the current uh, pandemic and the fact that so many of us are using this type of technology to communicate. Uh, it's, it, it's amazing to be able to have this opportunity from thousands of miles away. I, I hope that you can see a, a slideshow that I have on the screen. Uh, I will uh, use this uh, to describe the paper uh, that Bernard um, uh, gave a very helpful uh, uh, introduction uh, to in terms of the topic. And then afterwards, I'd love to answer any questions that you have or hear any reactions. And as Bernard said, the topic that I'm going to talk about is certainly not limited to the US. And my uh, co-author and I are continuing to work on this project, uh, both within the United States, looking at different agencies than the taxing authority, uh, and we're very interested in what other jurisdictions are doing. So I'd love to hear any comments and reactions that you have during our time. So this paper examines how the rise of artificial intelligence in administrative guidance is producing a new phenomenon, what we call automated legal guidance. Through online tools, virtual assistance, and other technology, governments increasingly rely on artificial intelligence to help the public understand and apply the law. We show in this paper that automated legal guidance often relies upon what my co-author Leo Sosky and I have described as simplexity. Simplexity is where a government presents complex law as though it's simple, but it doesn't actually simplify the underlying law. It just presents it as though it's simple. That approach offers potential gains in terms of efficiency and ease of use, but it can also cause the government to present the law as simpler as than it really is. That can lead to less precise advice and even inaccurate legal positions. We argue that the use of simplexity in automated legal guidance is more powerful and pervasive than in uh, written static publications that you might pick up because this is advice that is personalized, it's non-qualified, and it's instantaneous. After we introduce this new development, we make several positive claims, address normative concerns, and then offer some concrete recommendations to policymakers. So first, what's automated legal guidance? This has emerged from the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, defining artificial intelligence itself is difficult. This is an amorphous concept. There's no universally accepted definition. Artificial intelligence generally includes the use of machines in a way that approximates or augments human intelligence. Machine learning does not rely on formal logic. Machines can be trained to make highly intelligent predictions based on patterns in data. Machines may begin to actually teach themselves, developing more and more accurate predictions as they obtain more and more data. In the US, this development has not gone unnoticed by the federal government. And I have on the screen uh, just a few of the executive orders uh, from the president and other agencies in the United States that all focus on this development, talk about how government agencies should start to think about the best practices around the use of artificial intelligence. Government agencies in the United States, and I know in the UK and other jurisdictions, use artificial intelligence and machine learning to surveil, to police, and to punish. For example, the government has the ability to use machine learning to identify likely crime hotspots, and then to recommend sentencing periods based on the likelihood of recidivism. This information is being used to make policing and sentencing decisions today in the United States. Outside of the criminal context, 
The Security and Exchange Commission in the US has indicated that it uses machine learning to identify potential fraud, as well as systemic market risks. This is all starting to feel like science fiction. Uh, I have an image from Minority Report, if you're familiar with this great Steven Spielberg film. Uh, and legal scholars uh, in the US and other jurisdictions have examined uh, some of the important implications of this development. For example, in the US, how to apply the Fourth Amendment, uh, which is uh, focused on privacy, uh, to uh, think about uh, crime technology, predictive crime technology, how to protect racial equality, and how to do that in an era of algorithms. We want to make sure they're not biased. How to preserve transparency when automated predictions drive the enforcement decisions. But to focus on the topic in this paper, we point out that the government does a lot more than just enforce the law. The government provides extensive services to the public. Of course, things like roads, national defense, public goods like social security and education benefits, but it also provides the service of making the public aware of the law and assisting the public in accessing it and in complying with it. Uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, is a prime illustration in the US. So I have on the screen language from the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. This was something that our Congress enacted in 1998. And the basic idea was to emphasize that the IRS is not just responsible for enforcing the law, but also is uh, an agency that should provide customer service to taxpayers. And so the Taxpayer Bill of Rights has a number of different obligations that the IRS must meet and rights of the taxpayer, including uh, the right to be informed. This right states that taxpayers have a right to clear explanations of the law, uh, the procedures that are in tax forms, instructions, publications, notices, correspondence. And so as this illustration shows, the government issues guidance in order to explain the law. So what's so special about guidance? Again, this is some of these points are US focused, but others I think apply in any jurisdiction. Starting with US administrative law though, guidance is special because it falls out of our normal administrative law requirements. We have requirements for things like regulations that the treasury issues that allow the public to have a chance to comment before those regulations go into effect. Guidance falls outside of all of those rules. Um, even though it doesn't have a formal place in the administrative law framework, scholars have shown that guidance can be highly influential on the public. Members of the public have a strong inclination to change their behavior to make it consistent with the guidance in order to avoid enforcement by the government. And so the combination of artificial intelligence and the government's use of uh, guidance has led to a little noticed phenomenon, the rise of automated legal guidance. The government is using artificial intelligence to automate its issuance of guidance to the public. Government at all levels in the US have been mimicking what private industry has been doing. Whenever you book a plane reservation, when we used to do that to fly or buy something online, automated customer service now may help you. And I'll give you a few examples from the US. These are uh, some at the state level. And also I can give you an example that I think Bernard alluded to uh, from another jurisdiction. Uh, at the state level, let's say you're in the state of Mississippi and you want to conduct an unclaimed property search. You think that there's property that you might have that you need, to, you, you need to run a search and find out more information. You can ask Missy. Missy is Mississippi's first artificial conversational chat bot. And uh, the state of Mississippi says that Missy's here to help you with your questions 24 seven. Uh, at the federal level, if uh, you're interested in learning about citizenship issues, you can talk to Emma. Emma is a computer-generated virtual assistant for the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. 
and Emma promises to answer all of your immigration and citizenship questions. You can even enable the sound so that Emma can speak her answers in English or in Spanish. Uh, Emma also, who I have on the screen, uh, actually is named for someone. Emma is named for Emma Lazarus. Emma Lazarus wrote the poem that uh, is at the uh, Statue of Liberty uh, in uh, New York Harbor. And uh, because of that symbol, uh, the immigration services used the name, uh, but that's not what Emma looked like. This is just a different image, uh, but that's Emma, the virtual assistant. Uh, also, uh, in the federal government in the US, if you want to enlist in the US Army, uh, you can ask somebody named Sergeant Starr, who is the virtual guide for the US Army and Army Reserves. And you can ask about whether you meet the age, the height, the weight requirements, and other requirements. Uh, internationally, there are other governments that are also making this leap. For instance, the Australian Taxation Office created Alex, who I have on the screen. Alex is a virtual assistant who helps taxpayers with their tax questions. And you can ask Alex questions just like you would if you were talking to a person. Uh, I did. I asked uh, lottery winnings. Are lottery winnings taxable? And I know this is always an interesting question, for me at least, because the answer differs depending on the country that you're in. And Alex told me the answer, no. Uh, lottery winnings are not taxable in Australia. And that's interesting. It's different from what we do in the United States, where they are taxable. And as a result of the success that the ATO has had with Alex, Alex also answers questions about other legal issues like intellectual property rights uh, and others. But one interesting point, uh, the shirt color that Alex is wearing changes. It's purple, but if it's another issue other than tax, it's a different shirt color. Anyhow, this is all uh, designed just to give you an overview of how these virtual assistants uh, uh, work. And I'd love to talk more about other examples, but uh, I mean, one thing I will mention really quickly, which is just an interesting point, is that we have found that these virtual assistants also tend to have a gender bias. They, they're almost always portrayed as female. And uh, I've even had some conversations with a couple of state uh, tax officials who were developing their own uh, virtual assistants and didn't realize they were just almost doing it uh, uh, subconsciously and wanted to think about whether that was uh, such a wise choice. Maybe they should uh, diversify this. So anyhow, there is a literature on this and we uh, have a couple of footnotes in the paper describing, describing this bias. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is an example of the types of virtual assistants that governments are using. Now to shift to tax. I'd like to describe what the IRS has been doing in the US. So the IRS has been publicizing more and more its interactive tax assistant, which it also calls EDA. And EDA is an online tool that provides answers to tax law questions on a range of topics. What's taxable? Am I entitled to tax credits? Uh, what is my filing status? And many others. So instead of a, a printed copy of a publication or an electronic copy, EDA asks the taxpayer to select the category of questions, for example, a category involving medical expenses, and then the taxpayer answers a series of questions. And after inputting all of this information, EDA delivers an answer to the taxpayer, and it even uh, says answer right at the top of the screen so that the taxpayer has some confidence and can move forward. One thing I will also note, even though the IRS has been publicizing EDA on its Twitter page and other social media like Instagram. Uh, well, I don't, I don't exactly know what's happening here. This is an image that we're seeing a lot as we near tax day this year in the US. I don't know if the robots are taxpayers or if the robots are also getting advice from a robot behind the door. I don't know exactly, but it has something to do with artificial intelligence. I think that's, that's the point. And it is a beautiful image. Um, but Ida doesn't have a face, unlike Emma or Alex or the others. We don't really know who Ida is. So my co-author and I have uh, sort of made an artist rendering of Ida. Maybe, maybe this is Ida. I don't know. In one of the future uh, many spin-offs uh, of the Star Wars series, we'll find out that Ida is uh, R2-D2's tax-savvy cousin. Anyhow, to get more serious, Ida is uh, really a great example of automated legal guidance that relies on simplexity. So again, as my co-author Leo Sofsky and I have previously written, 
Simplexity occurs where the government presents complex law as though it's simple, but it doesn't simplify the underlying law. Automated legal guidance offers gains in terms of efficiency, but it can also cause the government to present the law as simpler than it, than, than it really is. Uh, and uh, sometimes it causes the government to offer advice that is, uh, well, potentially at odds with the underlying uh, legal authorities. In many cases, EDA guides taxpayers to the right answer, and it doesn't require taxpayers to comprehend and apply uh, complex tax law. But in other cases, it delivers answers that fail to fully explain the law, especially exceptions. And sometimes EDA will add additional gloss, which is not in the law itself. EDA often provides answers that are consistent with the tax law, but sometimes these answers will deviate because of its use of simplexity. Sometimes the deviations are taxpayer favorable, sometimes they are taxpayer adverse. So let me give you now a few examples from the actual EDA website. And the site is, is again being used this tax season in the US if you're interested in playing around with it yourself. I'll give you some examples of how it works. So again, when taxpayers have questions about issues that are relatively straightforward to explain and they're unambiguous, EDA can deliver accurate responses to those questions quickly and efficiently. So for example, Imagine there is a computer programmer from India who moves to the United States and is a lawful permanent resident in the United States. And the computer programmer is in California to set up a branch office of the Indian company. And after one year, the programmer tries to figure out whether uh, he has to file a tax return and, and, and when is it due? So he visits EDA and he clicks on a category of questions. What is the due date for my federal tax return? Or am I eligible to request an extension? So I did this in 2020. You're going to see the references to 2020. Ida then asks this question. Will you, uh, or if uh, you have a spouse, your spouse, uh, and you're married filing jointly, be living outside of the US and Puerto Rico on April 15, 2020? And the programmer says, well, no. That, I, I won't be, I'll be in the United States. EDA then delivers the answer, answers to your general filing questions. Your tax return is considered timely if filed by April 15, 2020. So EDA gave a very clear answer to admittedly this pretty simple question. If the programmer had answered that middle question differently, EDA would have give, given a different answer, June 15. As an aside, these deadlines were extended because of the pandemic, but that's not the key point. I, I, I did think though, I should mention it just in case you were really focused on that issue. Uh, now, sometimes EDA can give answers like this, but other times it can deviate from the law. So now I'll give you some examples of this. Um, EDA can deliver accurate answers to basic issues like what's the due date for filing my tax return or what form should I use? But sometimes it delivers answers that deviate from the underlying tax law that are seemingly favorable to taxpayers. So I'll give you a California example, because this is more uh, appropriate for California, where we have a large entertainment industry. Imagine there's an aspiring model living in Los Angeles, and he wants to alter his physical appearance, specifically the spacing in his teeth. And this, he thinks, will help get jobs in print and online advertisements. And he tries braces and other measures. But finally, he, vis he visits uh, an oral surgeon, and the surgeon says, you can replace your front teeth with artificial teeth and it will cost $10,000, but it will look much better. And so of course, after hearing this news, the model goes to EDA to find out, is that tax deductible? Can I deduct that expense? There's a whole category. Can I deduct my medical and dental expenses? And EDA then asks a question, well, what is the expense for? And one of the options is artificial teeth. And so the model clicks artificial teeth. Ida then says, unambiguously, your artificial teeth expenses are a qualified deductible expense. And that's the answer. And if the model chose to do this and deduct the expense for the procedure, if the IRS were to audit this expense and it learned that the reason for the procedure was cosmetic, then the IRS could challenge that deduction 
as violating a, a law in our internal revenue code, which says that cosmetic surgery is not deductible. So Ida asked for very simplified inputs. What was it? Artificial teeth? But it didn't ask questions about the reason for this expense. It didn't ask, for example, was this a surgery necessary because of an accident you were in or some type of condition or deformity? Uh, Ida didn't ask any of that. And as a result, in this case, it gave an example which is at odds with the clear statutory law. Another uh, example, lead-based paint. So imagine that the owner of a small construction company has two young children and she's decided she wants to remove paint that's on the walls in her own house because she noticed it's cracking and it is lead-based paint. And she doesn't want her children to get injured by accidentally ingesting any of this paint. And she wonders, is there any type of tax deduction I can claim for repainting my house? Well, when she goes to EDA under the category of medical expenses, there is a whole section on lead-based paint removal. And the first question is, did you pay for the cost of removing lead paints? Yes. Was the surface from which the paint was removed in poor repair cracking or within the child's reach? Yes, that was the whole point. EDA then says, your lead-based paint removal is a qualified deductible expense. It's a medical uh, deductible expense. And so she deducts it. Now that's the answer that Ida provided. But if we read the underlying law upon which these questions are based, it's in a revenue ruling called Revenue Ruling 7966 in the US, the IRS addressed this issue and said the deduction is only allowed if the removal is pursuant to a doctor's recommendation. A doctor's note is necessary. Here, Ida simplified the description of the law, which was sort of implicit in the questions that it asked, and it failed to ask questions about certain requirements, like a doctor's note. Ida, as a result, led the taxpayer to take a potentially deniable deduction, while at the same time leading the taxpayer to believe that she's met all of the legal requirements. Another example, which is sort of a classic for people who teach tax law in the United States, involves clothing. There is a set of cases involving clothing. If I buy a suit for work, can I take a tax deduction as a business expense? Uh, and there are cases that we all teach on this topic because it's an interesting way to learn about the contours of, of what it means to be income and what's a personal expense in the US. So imagine that you're a maitre d' at a fancy restaurant and you buy a tuxedo that you're required to wear to work. Can you deduct the cost of the tuxedo? Well, Ida can help with this because there's a whole set of questions on work clothes. And if you go to Ida, Ida asks, were you required to wear these work clothes as a condition of your employment? Yes. Ida then asks, are the clothes suitable for everyday wear? Well, nobody wears a tuxedo every day unless you conduct an orchestra every day or you're a cartoon character, of course not, so no. Ida then says, great, you have an allowable deductible expense and you can deduct the interesting point about this answer is that there is a case that all of these questions are based on. And if you read the case, it's called Pevsner v. Commissioner in the US. That case says that you can deduct clothing if it's required as a condition of employment, it's not adaptable to general use, and it's not so worn. Not adaptable to general use is the key term in that holding. And the idea is if you had a piece of clothing that you could ever wear for general use and you buy it for work, well, then you can't deduct it. A tuxedo you might wear to a wedding or another event, that could be general use. But that's not the set of words that the IRS uses in EDA. Instead, it uses this term in the middle of the screen, everyday wear. Where does everyday wear come from? That's not in the case. Everyday wear sounds a little bit different from adaptable to general use. So if the taxpayer claims the deduction for the tuxedo, because the taxpayer assumes I don't wear this every day, it's not everyday wear, the IRS may challenge it because again, it could be adaptable for general use. This is a taxpayer favorable deviation because the terms that EDA uses do not appear in the statutes or the regulations. I'll give you one last uh, set of examples examples that are adverse to the taxpayer. 
Uh, the complexity inherent in EDA not only can lead to questionable answers that benefit the taxpayer, but also to answers that conflict with the taxpayer's interests. For example, teeth whitening, another tooth example, but these are just colorful examples. We could go on and on all day. Um, I'll give you just these last two, teeth whitening. Imagine a taxpayer is a cancer survivor and after chemotherapy uh, discovers that the taxpayer has discolored patches on uh, her teeth. And so she spends over $1,000 on professional teeth whitening from her dentist in order to address this issue. She then visits Ida to determine, is there any type of a medical expense deduction that I can claim for the teeth whitening? They weren't covered by insurance. I had to pay for them. So shortly after she clicks the medical and dental expenses category, there's a whole set of expenses and one of them is teeth whitening. She selects teeth whitening and the IRS says, teeth whitening is not deductible. You can't take a tax deduction. Pretty clear. But if you read the tax law, there is a revenue ruling on this specific topic that the IRS issued in 2003, where the IRS said that teeth whitening expenses are not deductible medical care, where they do not treat discoloration caused by a disfiguring disease or treatment. Well, that is what's happening here. The whole reason for the teeth whitening is because of a disease and the treatment of the disease. In this example, the taxpayer um, may not have claimed the deduction because what, of what Ida said, even though the taxpayer uh, would have been entitled to it. Final example, college scholarships. Somebody is a star uh, football player in the United States, what we would call soccer, and gets a scholarship to a university as a result of playing soccer. And under the terms of the scholarship, uh, the student will get the scholarship as long as she meets the eligibility requirements for playing soccer and participating in different promotional events that the university has. And her parents are trying to figure out, do we need to report that scholarship as income? Is it taxable? Ida has a whole set of questions on this. Do I include my scholarship as income on my tax return? Ida asks the taxpayer, what portion of the scholarship was a payment for services you were required to perform as a condition of receiving the scholarship? And the parents answer, well, all of it. That was the whole point. You have to play soccer to get the scholarship. As a result, Ida says, well, the scholarship is taxable. You must include it as taxable income. It's instantaneous and unambiguous. Again, this is a response that's very clear. However, the IRS has held that athletic scholarships are not taxable as long as they are not canceled in the event that the student can't participate. Uh, for example, if the student is injured and can't participate, as long as the scholarship is not going to be canceled, then it is not taxable. Ida, however, didn't ask any questions about the terms of the scholarship. It just saw that uh, the parents selected that it was a payment for the services of playing soccer and caused the parents uh, to receive an answer that the scholarship was taxable. All of these examples are in our paper. We have others, and uh, we're continuing to, to, to work on this issue specifically with tax. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about these during the Q&A. But just to move on to think about now, what is the implication of all of this? If we think about automated legal guidance versus a written publication you might pick up from the tax office, we think there's a big difference. First personalization, the taxing authority is speaking directly to the taxpayer through this automated legal guidance. This is very different from a general publication that anybody can pick up and read. In nearly all cases, the questions that Ida asks use second person pronouns, you, yours. Uh, behavioral research shows that personalized communication like this can have a greater impact on recipients' beliefs and actions than generic statements. Second, automated legal guidance offers non-qualified answers to taxpayer inquiries. Consider the model and the artificial teeth. Ida did not respond that the artificial teeth expense is deductible as long as the procedure was necessary to ameliorate a deformity arising from a congenital abnormality or a personal injury or a disfiguring disease. No, Ida took a binary approach, deductible, or not deductible. And then it presented its response as a quote unquote answer. 
IRS publications, on the other hand, often have a general discussion of requirements and exceptions and have much more information in their explanation than what EDA is delivering. Finally, automated legal guidance can deliver information more immediately than static written publications. These tools reduce the taxpayer's incentive to do any additional research or to ask questions of an advisor. Again, EDA is providing an answer and it's doing it almost instantaneously. So how should automated legal guidance evolve? Shifting from the descriptive to the normative, uh, we think uh, first the, the question we should consider is how should the government use automated legal guidance to reach different types of taxpayers, different user populations? When automated legal guidance relies on complexity to make otherwise complex law understandable, it tends to do so by both reducing the uncertainty that would be inherent in standards and the complexity that would flow from reading many rules. Now, this may make sense for certain populations of taxpayers. For individuals with low income, the cost of applying complex tax rules is high. These taxpayers often don't have any access to sophisticated legal advice. However, when using automated guidance for low income taxpayers, we think it's important that the government not systematically increase their tax liability. So for this population, we argue that the government should adopt a pro-taxpayer default in its automated legal guidance. The government's goal also should not be to attempt to deliver automated legal guidance on every possible subject for every possible population. EDA does not need to address topics like the taxation of dividends and capital gains. These are topics that are relevant for high-end taxpayers and business taxpayers. They have access to sophisticated legal advisors. Maybe EDA should not be used uh, to address any of those topics. Uh, uh, rather, to the extent that we are going to have to rely on complexity to deliver this automated legal guidance, it may make sense to offer this type of service for populations where understanding the law is overly burdensome. EDA currently covers some topics that are likely to be important for the average taxpayer. Uh, we argue the IRS could add additional topics to EDA, like the earned income tax credit, which is probably the most complex section of the entire tax law in the US, and it is a benefit for low income taxpayers, uh, the child credit, and other notoriously complex provisions that affect many low income individuals. And so when adding these topics, especially if they involve uncertainty, we argue the IRS should design the answers to adopt the, the pro-taxpayer, the taxpayer favorable default. I'll also speak just for a couple of minutes about administrative process. How should the government ensure adequate administrative process for automated legal guidance? In administrative law, the classic solution in the US for ensuring transparency and accountability is what I described at the very beginning as the notice and comment process. And this is used for legislative rules. Legislative rules include agency statements of the law that can bind the agency so that whatever it says, it's now bound. It's often difficult to draw the line between legislative rules and other types of statements, what we often call interpretive statements by an agency. Those are statements where there is not a requirement for notice and comment. Automated legal guidance falls in a gray area when the IRS tells taxpayers on EDA that artificial teeth are deductible, it seems to be making a statement of the law. That seems like a legislative rule. However, there are many reasons to suggest that if anything, EDA's advice is interpretive. Even though the IRS takes the position that the statement is just interpretive, many taxpayers are going to rely on EDA when they fill out their tax return. EDA illustrates how the automated nature of legal guidance exacerbates the problem of trying to ensure appropriate process around agency statements of the law. This type of automated guidance is subject to even less oversight than other forms of agency statements. When the IRS, for instance, makes uh, a form that you fill out or a written publication, those documents go through a lengthy review process. EDA, and other types of automated legal guidance don't undergo that form of review. Further, the decisions that automated guidance is making 
often are the result of decisions that computer programmers and coders have made. And that's all occurring behind the scenes in ways that the public is not even equipped to understand. So as agencies turn to automated legal guidance to efficiently advise the public, we argue that the government should use automation itself as a trigger for additional oversight, review, and even public comment in order to ensure that the guidance is considered to be legitimate. Penalties are the final topic that I'll talk about. Um, what happens if you rely on automated legal guidance and then you find out you were wrong and the taxing authority attempts to apply a penalty? Should those penalties apply? As we've shown, where the legal issues rely on factual assumptions or involve ambiguous legal standards, automated legal guidance can provide advice that is at odds with the actual law. There are important differences between automated legal guidance and other forms of informal guidance, like oral advice that the government agencies can provide. Policymakers, we argue, should recognize and address these differences by making changes to the structure of both the tax penalties and also the design of the automated legal guidance itself. Taxpayers who use EDA and then try to use what EDA said to defend against tax penalties face a number of difficulties. Right on the EDA website, the IRS says that the provision in our tax law called the penalty abatement provision that applies whenever the taxing authority gives erroneous advice, it doesn't apply to anything that EDA says. In addition, the IRS applies certain penalties called accuracy related penalties in the US. And we have specific defenses that taxpayers can raise against those uh, for example, by saying, I have a reasonable basis for taking this position because the statute or the regulation said this, it is not possible under our law to rely on anything that EDA says to claim that type of defense. And finally, we have a defense called reasonable cause and good faith. And this is often something that taxpayers rely on when they aren't sophisticated or when they listen to what the lawyer or accountant said. It's really difficult to rely on what EDA says to make that reasonable cause in good faith defense. And I'll, I'll explain why in just a moment. The absence of the defenses against tax penalties where taxpayers rely on automated legal guidance raises significant fairness concerns. The IRS is frequently telling taxpayers that EDA is providing answers to your questions. And that is something that allows the uh, taxpayer to have some confidence in what the IRS is saying. But Wealthy taxpayers who can afford to pay for written legal opinions from tax lawyers or accountants can use those documents to rely on them, but also to defend against tax penalties in the future. So currently, there are greater opportunities for the most well-off taxpayers compared to others to obtain written advice that they can use to defend against penalties. We argue that the available defenses against penalties can be reformed by adjusting the penalties and the design of automated legal guidance. How could the law be reformed regarding penalties? One simple uh, way to change the law is to provide that one of the ways you can show a reasonable basis defense is that you can produce the guidance that you received from EDA. How could we provide some more fairness to the process from the government's perspective? We could require the taxpayer to disclose in advance when filing the tax return that the taxpayer is relying on something that EDA uh, is saying. Also, automated legal guidance could be reformed. One approach could be to redesign the system itself so that the taxpayer receives a written record of every input into EDA and the ultimate answer. And the taxpayer can then use that record to establish a defense. Under current law, it's very difficult to establish a defense because EDA does not provide you with a list of all of the responses that the taxpayer provided uh, to the IRS. And the simple uh, decision tree structure that EDA uses would make it possible to create that record uh, for the taxpayer. And then the taxpayer could use it to try to assert a reasonable cause defense. Just to conclude, thinking now about the future, how should automated legal guidance evolve? Should it rely more or less on simplexity? In the future, it's possible that artificial intelligence could examine our financial and other tax relevant transactions like our business trips, our medical events, and the like. Uh, artificial intelligence could monitor our email, bank records, physical locations, 
in order to allow the government to seamlessly fill out our tax return for us. Would that evolution in automated legal guidance be desirable? What are the costs and benefits? We believe that our analysis in this article is essential to starting to think through those questions. One of the big costs of that future form of AI would be the loss of the ability of the public to even think about what the law is, uh, let alone understand it. More sophisticated forms of AI may avoid some of the costs of complexity that we've examined here, but some of the issues inherent in the forms of automated legal guidance we've described will persist and, and new dangers will be introduced. In this paper, we've offered a roadmap for how governments should evaluate the trade-offs and minimize the costs as automated legal guidance evolves. And uh, with that, I'd like to just conclude and thank you for listening and any comments or questions I'd love to use the remaining time to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josh. That was a, really an excellent presentation on, on what I really believe is a, an innovative um, and groundbreaking piece of research. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, on an area that is uh, you know, a, an issue that's not going away. On the contrary, as you suggest, it's only going to become uh, more uh, um, uh, salient as time goes on and more uh, and, uh, and no doubt more problematic as well for some of the reasons that you alluded to. Um, we have some time for questions and answers. I actually have a, a question myself, but I'd like to give the, the audience an opportunity first. So um, the first question um, from uh, Jagandan, Jagandan uh, Munisami, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, have the laws in the U.S. been amended so as to provide for automated legal guidance? And would you say that the legal value of the guidance of ETA, uh, and thank you for telling us it's ETA, I kept assuming ITA. Um, it sounds more personal as ETA. So, uh, um, but uh, would you say that the legal value of the guidance of ETA is similar to search results you'd get by Googling? There's really two questions. Yeah, this is a great question. So the reason that uh, I think that this is such an exciting topic is that there really is not law currently on this specific type of guidance um, in the US. We do have a set of procedures as I described for when written publications are produced, but even the law in terms of what taxpayers can uh, rely on is, is not 100% clear when it comes to the written publications. The, type of guidance we're looking at now, which is surely going to replace the written publications. I mean, we're all getting everything on our phone uh, or our watch, uh, and that's going to only continue into the future. That, that's an area where there have not even been policies adopted across the federal government in the US in terms of best practices. And then the law itself has not caught up. It's not like there are cases that we um, uh, I could cite to in the US to uh, uh, address situations where taxpayers tried to rely on uh, what Ida uh, said uh, as a tax defense. And I should be clear, this is not just a tax issue. I'm a tax person, and so I know I'm here at the Institute, and this is the topic that's of most interest uh, to me normally, but um, we've learned in our research, this is something that affects almost all of the federal agencies in the United States from the US Postal Service to the Army, Immigration, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and at states as well. And so your question, I think, is a really important one because it, uh, it, it, it emphasizes the need uh, to think about the best practices, but also what should the value be? One thing I will no note is that EDA is a very primitive tool. It is essentially a yes, no decision tree. It is not machine learning. EDA isn't going to change as it starts to receive inputs from the taxpayers. And I have had conversations with some of the top people at the IRS who are responsible for EDA. My sense is that EDA is primitive by design. The government does not want EDA to do things it can't predict or for, um, it to learn and change its responses because if taxpayers tried to rely on those responses, that could put the IRS, the government, in a very difficult position. The government wants to control the information that EDA is delivering. 
And so in this particular example, eta is primitive. Now, there, th that raises interesting issues. For example, transparency and fairness in terms of what the taxpayer can receive as a record. It's a lot easier with eta because it's a pretty simplistic structure. There are other types of automated legal guidance that the federal government is using that do appear to be more like crowdsourcing or machine learning. And that raises a set of, I mean, actually much harder issues. What do we do when the government wasn't the actual speaker, but it was this technology? And maybe what do we do if it was a response that a crowd uh, was able to uh, uh, turn into the response that you saw first? Um, we think that it's necessary to think about these different approaches and some may be more um, uh, you know, amenable to uh, being the type that taxpayers could rely on and others uh, uh, maybe not for good reason. But anyhow, thank you for the question. And I think this gave me a chance to talk a little bit uh, more about how, um, how uh, uh, much of an unsettled landscape this is. Yeah, th thank you, Jagannathan, for the question. And, and also, if I, we have another question, but if I can jump in, that's uh, for one second. That's very interesting because one of the things that strikes me is that ETA, by comparison to some of the other, uh, not just the federal government, but again, being a tax person, thinking about the tax chatbots, is, as you say, it's, a, it's a quite a, a, a primitive uh, sort of decision tree type of mechanism. So it's a very interesting to hear that your sense is that it, it, that's deliberate, a deliberate choice by the IRS. I wonder, though, um, uh, so and that then I guess sort of makes one wonder why other jurisdictions appear to be going more in the direction of machine learning, at least if I understand some of the other uh, tax chatbot and, and voice mm -hmm. mechanisms that are out there. Um, but also, uh, it does make me wonder how long that is sustainable um, in the current broader guidance of this country. Right. And certainly as the gap will just get wider and wider between what the private sector businesses exactly. are doing uh, compared to what the government is providing. I have had very long conversations when trying to book plane reservations or set up cable television service and I'm talking with a chatbot. And yeah. the answers are, it's, it's, it's amazing what the technology can now do. Uh, but you're, I think, exactly right. I don't think it's sustainable. I think at some point, we're going to move to the much more sophisticated forms, which are going to make these issues even even harder when it isn't an actual person who programmed the answer, but it's the it's the technology that is uh, uh, providing the response to taxpayers and 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 others who are using government resources like this to receive guidance. Yeah. No, absolutely. So it's uh, it's certainly going to be uh, continue to be very salient. Um, and we have a, uh, another question. Uh, this is from Michael Pollan. So first of all, he says, fascinating talk, which I certainly uh, 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 echo. And then he says, here in the UK, HMRC have built the Check Employment for Tax Status tool to assist and provide guidance on whether taxpayers are genuinely self-employed. One of the big issues here in the UK, is, as in the States, is this is employee versus self-employed question. Um, the, the, one of the other things that often we talk about, as you say, in introductory tax, uh, tax courses. Um, so, the, and then the question is, do you think one issue with automation is the binary decision-based tree approach that tends to be utilized by government agencies instead of more nuanced weighted approaches um, uh, and that are the focus also of law tech entrepreneurs? So it's somewhat related to, to the points that you were uh, making uh, in response to Jagannathan's question, but I guess amplifying on it. So mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to speak a little bit more about this. Right. I and think that similarity to, or the difference to the compliance end of what revenue authorities are doing. Sorry. Yes. This is exactly the issue that we have in the United States, whether somebody is an employee or an independent contractor is a very difficult issue because um, it's so fact dependent. Our case law in the United States requires us to think about how much autonomy the individual has or is, is the person taking orders from the employer. And uh, it's a huge issue, especially in our sharing economy. We've had cases involving Uber drivers, and this is a, a big issue. That's the type of issue that involves enough uncertainty that EDA could give an answer, just to talk about the US tax uh, uh, automated legal guidance, that seems clear, but it may not actually be consistent with, with the law. Um, 
we, we think that there could be a different approach in terms of our uh, suggested recommendations based on whether we're talking about something that is a relatively simple inquiry where there really is a binary answer, are you required to file the tax return or not, compared to something that involves this much legal uncertainty. And it doesn't have to be the case that taxpayers can rely on everything that automated legal guidance says in all situations, but rather a certain category could be the type where the answer is going, it is going to be something that automated guidance can uh, provide without having to ask lots of questions about the underlying facts. And so there could be a category that is much more attractive in terms of making it something that would actually bind the taxing authority compared to another type of um, inquiry where, again, the uncertainty makes it difficult to know uh, that the automated guidance is actually giving the correct answer. It also is, uh, again, as you saw with some of my examples, a system that taxpayers could abuse. I mean, I am a tax person and I teach tax law and love tax law. So I had lots of fun thinking about examples and plugging them into EDA. If I wanted to try to find a way to paint my house and claim a tax deduction, I think I gave you an example of how you could use EDA to try to do that, uh, even if you really didn't meet all of the requirements. But in any case, uh, thinking about these types of issues as separate categories is exactly the direction that we're, we're hoping to go as we think more about this topic. It shouldn't just be one approach for all types of, of questions, but there are different categories based on the, the level of uncertainty uh, involved. Thank you. No, very interesting uh, answer to a very interesting question. Um, we have two more, and I think we have just about enough time uh, to address them. So Deus Mugabe asks, uh, well, it says, we, we currently have a gray area in respect to legitimate expectation in some countries. Um, and many jurisdictions hold the view that if the interpretation by the tax authority is wrong, the taxpayer cannot rely on, you know, cannot use legitimate expectation as a defense. Um, does this not just worsen that or, or you know, amplify that problem? Absolutely. That is, that is uh, I, I think, the uh, best way to describe it as, a, in our view, a problem. The problem is, in the U.S., the view that was just described is exactly the approach. Uh, automated legal guidance is not something taxpayers can rely on to find the IRS. Neither are the written publications that are static and approved internally by different committees. You can't pick up that publication and say, this is what the publication told me, I'm gonna rely on it and it has to bind the IRS. They can't, uh, they, can't, they can't do something inconsistent with what they wrote in this publication. That is not the law. Uh, the taxpayer can't rely on it. So the reason why we think it's a problem is that effectively what has happened now is that there is a form of public guidance that the government is offering to help people comply with the law. And then there's private guidance that you can go buy from a tax lawyer or an accountant. And the, both of those types of guidance will help you decide as a taxpayer what to do. But only one type, the private guidance, is written in a way where taxpayers can not only rely on it, but also can try to use it to defend against tax penalties. Our rules say that if you have a tax advisor and the tax buyer advisor provides you advice and you reasonably rely on it, you can point to that as a reasonable cause of defense. And so we've set up a system, as you said, that exacerbates the problem by only making the uh, automated legal guidance more accessible, but providing none of the benefits in terms of reliance that you can get if you can afford the private guidance. And so the gap between what wealthy and not even low income, most other taxpayers are getting, uh, is, is getting wider and wider. And, and certainly as uh, the technology is just making this type of guidance more accessible and it really is more affirmative than what you would see in a written publication where the government has a chance to describe at least some of the exceptions. You just get a screen answer. And that's what we all want when we use technology. We want assurance. But yes, the, the, the gap between these two types of guidance, uh, it, I think, will grow as a result of uh, the use of this technology. 
Great, thank you. Um, okay, so um, uh, if we can move uh, on to the next question, Amir Rahman uh, asks, uh, so he says, very interesting topic indeed. Um, a simple question is, what if ETA in, inadvertently misguides a taxpayer um, and there are related complications? Um, would there be an exemption from, from such penalties? Um, because, you know, you, you've talked about that uh, a bit, um, uh, because in the uh, in the Pakistani uh, tax service, he says there is a law and clarification wing which provides official legal guidance to taxpayers, and they're still challenged in the courts. Right. So the answer to this question is no. Taxpayer cannot uh, say, "Ida told me I could claim this position, and I did." And even though now the taxing authority says I was wrong. Uh, I at least want a, to, to use that as a defense against penalties. And, uh, and, and actually, I want to be able to rely on what Edith told me. That is not possible in the United States under our laws. Uh, there are different reasons for this. Uh, I mean, one reason is that it used to be human beings answering these questions. And because human beings sometimes might give different answers, the IRS took the position that we are not going to let taxpayers rely on those answers that they're receiving from the human beings who are helping as customer service representatives because they might differ. EDA is very different because the government, as I showed you, is using a pretty simple decision tree where we know what the answer is going to be. There isn't going to be a lot of deviation. So that doesn't seem to be such a sympathetic case uh, for uh, exempting this type of guidance completely uh, as, as, as a way to defend against penalties. There is also a possibility that taxpayers could abuse EDA. For instance, there's a whole category under medical expenses for crutches. If I click crutches that you use when you break your leg, if I click crutches, automatically EDA tells me the crutches are always deductible. What if I bought the crutches for a costume or I had some other reason for buying the crutches? EDA doesn't ask anything like that. So if you wanted to use the system uh, and, and, and abuse the system, you might, especially if you could rely on the answers to defend against uh, penalties and, and, and as a way to show uh, reliance itself. The government takes the position that none of this uh, can be relied on uh, by the taxpayer. And again, especially as we uh, have just, I think, had a really great discussion during this Q&A about the gap growing between different types of advice, uh, we think that that's something that, that, that should be addressed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, and that's a very, uh, very good and interesting amplification of of, uh, um, of this set of issues. I mean, I, I suspect that anyone who would be sophisticated enough to abuse ETA in the way you suggest is probably not going to ETA. They're going to uh, one of our, you know, one of our students or, or alums rather for for tax advice. But but uh, the point is very well uh, taken that the, the potential for for abuse is certainly there. Um, Miguel Gumuccio, and again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, thank you so much. Uh, and then he asks, um, are there any uh, examples of cases in which an AI system or automated legal guidance um, uh, has made a wrong, you know, an incorrect response, given an incorrect response and caused damage to the taxpayer? In other words, that it's mm -hmm. court. So EDA is so new still that we have no cases on record where a taxpayer tried to defend against a deficiency the IRS found by pointing to EDA. However, we do have a number of cases where taxpayers pointed to the, the predecessor to EDA, which are called IRS publications. These are supposed to be plain language descriptions of the law. There's a famous case in the US involving a tax lawyer who read what the publication said involving retirement accounts and made some decisions involving his retirement accounts. And eventually the IRS audited the taxpayer and disputed what the taxpayer had done. And there was a case and the taxpayer in court said, I relied on what this publication said and I pointing to the language right here. And the court held that the, pu the publication was wrong and the taxpayer could not rely on it. And in fact, the publication was based on outdated proposed law from decades earlier and the publication had not just had not been updated. 
So there is law about the publications itself, and it is very government favorable. It is not um, uh, at, at all the normal case that a taxpayer can rely on the publication, uh, you know, even as a defense to penalties. With automated legal guidance, we're expecting the same result, but we have not seen cases yet because it's still relatively new. It's um, thank you. It's it's an interesting. Uh, I, I've always wondered. I've never looked at that uh, the the sort of the background to that case. I wonder if the result was the way it was, particularly because of who the taxpayer. <laughs> right. It is a it is a good question, and uh, uh, it, it is uh, possible that only somebody actually familiar with the law would be willing to take a dispute to the point of it becoming a public tax case. That's pretty rare in the US, but that is, that, that is a, good, a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, one, we have time, I think, for one last question um, uh, from uh, Jagannathan again. Um, he says, ETA is a good example of how AI or machine learning can help the taxpayer. In what ways, and I realize this is a sort of outside the scope of this particular paper, but you've also, um, I know, done work on this. Uh, how do you think AI could help the tax man or tax woman, right? The tax officials, for instance, tax evasion, avoidance schemes involving complex and frustrating investigations. Do you see a future for AI here, or is there a risk of creating, uh, you know, a, a, a too broad a net? And I think it actually, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to have some closure. We talked, we. Mm -hmm very briefly about the broader uses of AI. So it's, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jagannathan. That we, it's a good way perhaps to, to close the circle and to end this uh, excellent talk and Q&A. Oh, well, thank you for the question. And I think that this is a question we can answer by looking to what private industry does with all of these types of websites and customer service representatives. It's not just the consumer receiving help the companies are getting a lot of information from the consumer. What are the topics they're interested in? What are the things they have questions about? Even specific people who they can then track using cookies and other, other uh, approaches. So that's what private industry is doing. On the government side, as we think about automated legal guidance, my sense from talking with officials at the IRS is that they are aware of the extent to which certain questions are the ones that are being targeted uh, by taxpayers when they use EDA. Uh, th that is just really the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. EDA could absolutely help, as you said, the tax authority by providing the tax authority with some insights into issues that are causing taxpayers uh, to have questions that are confusing. And it might even be possible, almost as an exchange, to require a taxpayer to provide some personally identifying information in exchange for getting the the full list of inquiries and responses to be able to use them in the future to defend against tax penalties. Something as simple as your name and your social security number, which the IRS already has, would at least give the government some notice that the taxpayers are asking about these specific questions and uh, might prevent some of the abusive examples I was describing. People are not likely to give that personally identifying information when they're trying to use things like EDA to generate answers that they can then use to uh, defend against uh, abusive or even fraudulent uh, positions. So is it possible to help the taxing authority? Absolutely. On the other side of this, the government is seeing what taxpayers are asking about, confused about, and that's very exciting. I, again, not possible when all that you hear are uh, complaints and people calling the IRS hotline and debates going on in our legislature, Congress, the technology is making it possible for the government to have more of an insight into the taxpayer's process as the taxpayer tries to comply with the law. Great. Thank you very much. I will um, echo uh, what I said before, but also some of the comments that have come through in the uh, in the Q&A that are not questions, but rather uh, thanking you for a, a very excellent presentation. Um, indeed, we're uh, again, very happy that you were able to join us and I want to uh, thank you again and your co-author uh, for your uh, research and also to our um, very attentive um, and uh, good audience uh, for joining us and for asking all these uh, great questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope that we will be able to welcome you uh, back to 
the Institute and CCLS uh, in person next time uh, for uh, another talk. Well, thank, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for your great questions and for participating in this event. And, and thank you, Bernard and, and Christiana uh, for uh, everything uh, that you've done to make this possible. I hope that we can see you in person at UC Irvine in sunny California, or maybe at some point in London uh, when we are in better times, which hopefully will be here soon. So thank you very much. And it's been a, a really helpful session for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Everyone. Take care, everybody.